Friends, as you are no doubt aware, we are no longer meeting on Sunday mornings, but we want to try and offer to you an opportunity to reflect on the scriptures and to have a time of focus, maybe prayer. And so beginning this week, uh, we will make the sermon uh, available in the readings. Uh, we're hoping maybe next week we could also include some uh, musical worship and some prayers and have some different voices. Um, but today we want to read to you from the two readings. The first reading is Psalm 23, the set reading for this week. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then the second reading for today comes from, to us from John chapter 9. And we begin at verse 1. As Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is his day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But the man insisted, I am. He. How then were your eyes open? they asked. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man? they asked. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisee the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner perform, perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received a sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That is why his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind. But now I see. Then they asked him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. 
The man answered. Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet, you, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of the opening of eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the world blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What are we blind to? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Jesus, come and be our teacher. Come and inspire us by your word to be a people of, of faith. Come and deepen our hope in your promises that we might love. Amen. The simple reality is that in this passage we see an encounter with sickness and illness and disease. And so it makes sense to look at this passage in the light of the circumstances that surround our world at this time. The disciples are walking along and they see someone who's born blind and immediately this engages them. They want to understand and make sense of this in the light of the presence and power and providence of God. But it's interesting to note their question. They don't ask the question, why is this man blind? They ask, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? For the disciples and the peoples of Jesus' day, there was an automatic assumption that if somebody in some way was physically ailed, was sick or ill, that that was a consequence of their behavior. That because of what they'd done, God was inflicting this upon them. In fact, it went deeper than this. Not only could it happen because of what they had done, but if a member of their family had done something, they could be afflicted as well. And so that question, who sinned? This man or his family? What's interesting to note is that Jesus doesn't directly answer this question, but rather his actions begin to display the reality of the answer. For he begins to engage the man. Somebody who must have sat by the road for many, many days and years. Somebody who had felt abandoned. Somebody who had felt punished and wounded by God. Suddenly has an encounter in which they discover God's healing and graceful power and presence moving through them to heal, restore and make whole. Not only to heal and restore them physically, but to heal and restore them into community. But of course, as soon as he's healed, the religious authorities get news of this. We don't quite know how exactly it happened, but he's brought before them. And they begin to test and question and try to make sense. Their understanding was that if somebody was ill, diseased, sick, blind, deaf, it was a result of sin. So how then could God act? Because God was punishing them. It was almost like God going against God's self. You see, their, their idea about God was that they, their behavior dictated God's reaction and response. If one behaved according to the law and did the righteous acts, God would bless you and you would experience delight and joy. If one worked against the laws, well, then God would curse you. And they spent hours upon hours studying the minutiae of the law and trying to make sense of it so they could be certain that they were doing the right thing and God wouldn't punish them. You see, Jesus brings us to a different understanding of God. For Jesus, I would want to suggest to you today, suggests that God's response is not detected, dictated by our behavior. We cannot control God by what we do. The good news, though, is that we don't need to try. 
For in Jesus we see that God is a God of love, of grace, of mercy, and healing. The Pharisees are convinced that sickness and illness is a sign of God's displeasure, and healing is a sign of God's blessing. The strange part about this account is that even though they claim that is their fundamental belief, when it comes to Jesus, they refuse to allow their own belief system to define their response to Jesus. Because if they really do believe that healing is a sign of God's blessing, why then do they not celebrate Jesus, acknowledge him as someone acting on behalf of God? Rather, they refuse to accept the healing. They question it. They doubt it. We read that again and again. They, they say, tell us the truth. This can't be. Until finally, the man who was born blind says this. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard the opening of the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this word they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? Even in their own belief system, Jesus would be an agent of love and grace. But so stubborn are their hearts, so blinded are they, as Jesus goes on to tell us, that they refuse even to receive the gift of Jesus. I would even want to say I'm not even convinced that the blind man has got it right. For he says that God only listens to righteous people. And yet in the scriptures we discover that again and again, God hears the cry of those caught up in their sin and responds with grace and mercy. I wonder what it was like for that man to hear those words. You were born steeped in sin. I wonder how many, how many times that had been whispered behind this back or thrown into his face in the village market in the square. I wonder if ever he'd been excluded from community because of that statement. And so it's interesting to note his response when he encounters Jesus. He wants to believe, he longs to believe in this God that Jesus is revealing. He longs for this different narrative, this different account, this different character that Jesus is revealing of God to be true. And so when Jesus says to him, do you believe in the Son of Man? He says, who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe. There's a longing and a hunger for healing. And when Jesus says, you've now seen him, in fact, he is speaking to you. What an amazing response. Lord, I believe. But he didn't just believe. He worshipped Jesus. This week there have been so many stories in the news about this coronavirus. And for me, some of the sadness has been about the response of those of faith. Not just the Christian faith, but faith of many different colors and hues and frameworks. And one of the things that has saddened me is to hear again this, this narrative that if there is disease or illness, God is punishing. And so you see some of these prophets and fundamentalist teachers scurrying around looking for the reason. And they cast aspersions on various behavior patterns or, or various ways society is at and say, this is God punishing us for the way we do things. And yet I wonder what they would do with this text. How they would make sense of this text. Where it clearly seems to be that Jesus refuses to follow that narrative. In fact, his entire actions derogate and go on a different story in which he tells us and reveals to us that God is not punishing but rather that when we encounter God as through Jesus, we discover healing and hope. In fact, can I suggest to you today that Jesus is not revealing something new? For we read from a psalm as we started today. A psalm which describes God as a good shepherd. A psalm which describes God as someone who, when we are struggling in our souls, when we are fearful and anxious, leads us to quiet pools of water to restore our souls. Leads us to places to nourish us. Even when we walk through the darkest of valleys, which I think many of us feel we're in at the moment. In the darkest of valley, God says, I will be with you. And not just be with you. The promise is my rod and my staff will comfort you. The rod was a polished stick that each synagogue had, which was used to read the scriptures. The scriptures were not as we have them today. They were on beautiful scrolls that were expensive and carefully had been written by hand. And so no one touched them with their hands. There was no handy-handy to clean. And so they used a polished stick. And as somebody read, they would follow the words with that rod. 
That's why Jesus says, the rod as a means of comfort through Psalm 23. That's why we discover that God is offering to us the promise of God's desire to mend the entire world through Scripture. And we would do well to meditate upon Scripture, to contemplate it, to read it, to study it, to reflect on the message of God's presence and power and love revealed to us. Secondly, the psalmist talks about a staff. And of course a staff is a symbol of the defense, the power and authority of the, of the shepherd, of the sheep, that they do not go astray or get lost and that they are protected. And so the psalmist goes on to say that even though we have our enemies around us, and would you notice it doesn't say that the enemies are chased away or gone, but rather it says that in the midst of our enemies, in the midst of disease, of in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of loneliness and fear and anxiety, in the midst of all those things that come against us, promises that God will sustain us, offer us the resources we need to endure and to overcome. I will feed you and nourish you. At a feast, I will anoint your head with oil as a sign of my love. And then the psalmist says, Surely I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The simple reality is this pandemic is at work in the world in a way which has led to so many deaths already. But if we're going to place our trust into the God Jesus reveals, and the God the psalmist of Psalm 23 reveals, then we are those who can trust that even though death may come to us, come to our neighbours, our friends, our beloved, or come to ourselves, we can trust that we dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We are close to God, and God is close to us, and God will sustain us. So my invitation to you today is to think carefully about which God you believe in. Do you believe that we can control God's responses through our actions? That if we're good, God is good to us, and if we're bad, God is bad to us? Or are you willing to believe that there's nothing that we can do that can define God's behavior? Rather, God has chosen in Christ Jesus to love all, to love everyone in this world. And that love is consistent, and it is not dependent on our behavior. And so God will love us when things are going well. God will love us when things are struggling. But God is the one who only writes with words of love in our lives. So would you choose? If you want to choose the God that Jesus reveals, can I maybe invite you to do some repeat homework? I've given it to you before many times, but I give it to you again. Why don't you memorize Psalm 23? But can I invite you to maybe do something different? Can you make a habit of praying Psalm 23 for those you know and love? Maybe in the morning, each day as you wake, you can start by praying that psalm, but instead inserting each member of your family. The Lord is Helen's shepherd, she shall not want. The Lord is Nathan's shepherd, he shall not want. The Lord is Reuben's shepherd, he shall not want. And pray that psalm in full over each of the members of your family, but instead inserting their name. Maybe then at lunchtime you want to do the same for the colleagues you're close to. To pray it over them. Maybe in the evening you want to pray it about others who you love and care about. Friends and family and others around this, this community. Maybe just before you go to sleep. You want to pray it for our country. Maybe even you want to pray it for your enemy. Who God loves as much as God loves you. And so I invite you at this time. To allow God to draw close to you. Allow God to be the one who sees you, notices you, and wants to be with you. Allow God to be gracious and merciful. I pray God blesses you in this. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for the way you come to reveal God to us. To come and disturb the false narratives that so often undermine our faith and cause us fear and anxiety. And instead you come to remind us of the truth of the character of your Father, the Good Shepherd. That you reveal that in your own behavior and that you remind us that you come to do the Father's will. And the Spirit comes to bless and anoint that reality. And so Father, Son and Holy Spirit, Sustainer, Redeemer, Creator, you are the one who seeks to love and love all. 
Help us to welcome your presence in our lives. Help us to draw close to you, the Good Shepherd. Help us to receive the gifts you want to give at this time. Help us to be reminded that your light shines in the darkness, and the darkness shall never overcome it. We pray this in your name. Amen. God be with you this week, and may you find God's presence in the words of Scripture.